You are listening to the One Day at a Time podcast. On this podcast, my guests share their stories of alcoholism, addiction, and how they recovered so that you can too. My hope is that you find the inspiration and resources you need to let go what's holding you back so that you can transform into the person you were always meant to be. Ready? Here we go. Hello, loves. Thank you for downloading the podcast. My name is Arlena, and I'll be your host. In case we haven't met yet, I'm a certified recovery coach and hypnotist. I help people get sober, stay sober, and go deeper through scientifically proven tools and spiritual practices. I have been practicing abstinence from drugs and alcohol since April 23rd of 94, and I've seen recovery grow and evolve over the years with a lot of different options. I encourage you to explore it all and find what works for you. Today, my guest is author and recovery coach, Fauna Asfa. She oversees a private and prestigious young women's transitional sober living in Los Angeles, California, and founded the good work in helping young women rebuild their lives on their own terms. Fauna also published her memoir, Sober Daughter, a memoir of grief, addiction, and recovery. We talk about what was the root cause of her addiction, how she processed the death of both her parents at a very young age, and how she was able to escape and overcome alcoholism. Before we jump in, please follow the podcast on Instagram at ODAT Podcast for daily inspiration and additional free resources, including access to over 200 past episodes, book reviews, and general sobriety support. So there you have it. With that, please enjoy this episode with Fauna. Well, Fauna, thank you so much for joining me today. Thank you so much for having me. Oh my goodness. I am so excited to talk to you. Um, you are young and beautiful and you have so much going on for you. You just finished publishing this book, Sober Daughter, A Memoir of Grief, Addiction, and Recovery. Amazing. Congratulations. Thank you so much. Thank tell, you. Tell me a little bit about what that book writing process was like. That had to be intense. It is intense. It is. I, I now understand why so many people don't want to write a book. <laughs> it's, it is like when they say, you know, like a labor of love or, um, you know, like a creative baby. Um, that's just like the fun part of it. I think there's just so much that goes into it. And I did it. I just jumped in. I didn't even plan ahead. I just kind of had this. Well, since I was young, I've always been a writer And um, my mom's, you know, favorite thing to say is, you know, you you have to write a book. You're going to write a book. You're going to write a book. And when I was younger, I was like, can you please stop saying that? Like, I'm going (laughs) to do everything opposite (laughs) of that. And um, yeah, my just my life, you know, took crazy turns. And then um, I ended up having a, a really big story that I just had, I had to get out. Like yeah. it was just that guttural feeling of like, I just have to get it out. I don't even know what that means. I just have to get it out. Got to get it out. Well, listen, I think that you, this book is going to help a lot of people. And I, I think your story is amazing. We're going to jump into your story in a little bit, but I thought what we would do first is play a fun little game called the lightning round. Are you ready? Uh, I think so. (laughs) You look terrified. It'll be fine. (laughs) (laughs) When you first got sober, was there a book that helped you the most when you first got sober? Something that really Uh, impacted you? You know what? I was obsessed with um, The Power of Now. (gasps) same by Eckhart Tolle I was I just I I it was so otherworldly and getting sober to me felt otherworldly so I just like really I, I I carried it with me everywhere and I thought it was just the most amazing thing I'd ever read I still love that book I know it's an it's a it's an amazing book he's an amazing author um the his sort of um sophomore encore book was uh a new earth and that was also did you read that one too i have it i haven't started <laughs> oh my goodness uh when you get a chance i think you'd really like that one it's super good. oh um, yeah anything he does i'm i'm here for it he's brilliant, <laughs> he's so brilliant. Good. 
Um, and uh, do you have a favorite quote or mantra, maybe like an idea that you live by that you keep coming back to? Oh my gosh, I have so many. I feel like my brain is just a bunch of like affirmations to keep going. <laughs> Um, Do you want me to throw out a couple of mine? Maybe that'll spark an idea or give you a little time. Well, to I, think about. I have, I have one that's just always, it's actually tattooed on me, but it's it? progress, not perfection. Oh my God. That was exactly what I was going to say. Really? <laughs> yeah. I was, that was going to be like, well, I'll give her, I'll throw one out just to give you just to stall a little bit, give you a chance to think. And that's what I was yeah. going to say. <laughs> Yeah, it, it hits all my all my little uh, idiosyncrasies that I want to, you know, like, don't worry about perfectionism. Don't put it off. Don't try and make it be this whole big thing. Just take little chunks. Yeah. And just keep it pushing. It's so interesting, this idea of perfection. You know, I mm-hmm. think if we grow up with either a critical parent or some kind of low, you know, low self-esteem, we overcompensate with perfectionism. And that sometimes can feel us leaving paralyzed, don't you think? Absolutely. I mean, that's one of the biggest challenges I had was to work through and kind of dismantle my perfectionism. Mm. And um, it absolutely came from, you know, critical parents, but also internalizing my own lens of being so harsh on myself and that turned into you know this lens that I would see everything as if I'm not presenting a certain way they'll actually see me and if they actually see me they'll see that I'm a big old mess Mm -hmm. and um yeah I, I really had to break that down so that I could just you know allow myself to be human right and I see other people as human and humanity, what a thought. Yeah, I mean, it does, you know, ultimately the work is about healing and having compassion for yourself and as, you know, and for others too, right? Everyone makes Absolutely. mistakes. And I think those of us that struggle with that perfectionism, when we make a mistake, man, we are so hard on ourselves. I know. And it's just, the it takes me back to the progress, not perfection, because yeah. I, I'm grateful that I get to try and that looks like mistakes and I have to reframe and look at that and see, I would have never learned or or seen that mistake if I hadn't tried and I'm, I'm willing to try. And then that gets me to, I'm willing to make a mistake. And then that gets me to, Oh, I'm willing to say I'm a beginner and I'm just learning. And then it gets you to a place where if, if maybe I know something I'm, able to see the other person and and let them, you know, have their own experience and their own kind of stumbling blocks, which are all really just growth. Absolutely. There's a Dan Millman book, uh, The Way of the Peaceful Warrior. He talks about uh, there are no mistakes or only lessons. Mm -hmm. And a lesson is repeated until it's learned. And we have evidence of learned behavior, uh, a lesson learned by a change in behavior. That seems way more compassionate, doesn't it? I mean, that wasn't what was running through my head a long time ago, but that's what I try and say now. Right. Yeah. Listen, it's all about the power of now. See what I did there? Uh Uh-huh. Yeah. Uh (laughs) Um, Let's see. Do you have a regular self-care or recovery routine? Like, are there things that you do weekly or daily? What does that look like for you? Yeah. Uh, well, my recovery routine is really uh, threefold. I just, I, I try really hard to stay in my spiritual practice. And for me, that just means prayer. That means meditation. That means um, connecting in the nature mm. and feeling something bigger than myself, especially when the perfectionism or those things come on where I really need to like get it in perspective. Yeah, for sure. (laughs) And then um, mental and, you know, just like for me, I work, um, I'm in a program, I'm in support programs. So for me, that looks like working my program. I have a sponsor. I have people of a community that I'm a part of showing up for that community, being accountable for that community service and moving my body. 
like exercise or somatic practices or I you know like for me for the perfectionism it it I'm breaking that idea that I had to do something and do it really really well and be like this idea I literally just want to move my body so if I'm if I'm like have it you know my my steps I want to hit certain steps if I, you know, if I, I'm squatting, like I do squats randomly, I do, do, like I have a gym in my building. So I'll go there three times nice. a week. If somebody wants to hike, I'm like, let's go. Like, I just, I just try and be way more willing than I was before to just be active and just yeah. like move. <laughs> just move. <laughs> just <Man>. move. <laughs> just move. Man, the p- pandemic did nothing for my ass. Let me tell you. I'm saying, I'm saying like just moving just moving yeah because I can I I clearly could watch Netflix for eight hours yeah. so <laughs> it's not funny yeah yeah, yeah. oh that's but really it, good it helps me so much I mean I can tell if I I mean I have like a weird little you know like frame of what my week looks like that I want to be active in and if I'm off you know, and if something comes up, like life happens, I can definitely feel like I'm like, oh, I need to go to the gym or I need yeah. to go. I need to check in and move and sweat. And Yeah. yeah. So good for your brain, especially. Yeah. yeah, yeah. Not just not just the booty. Yeah. Um, <laughs> right. Um, what's one thing you wish you knew when you first got sober? Oh gosh. Um, Damn. I wish I knew that I'm not supposed to know (laughs) because I, I went, I, I was so crippled at the beginning with like, Oh my God, what are these people doing? What am I supposed to be doing? Am I doing it right? Am I asking the right questions? Am I, and it's like, I'm not supposed to know. I, I literally had never been sober before. Yeah. Like I, I was drinking since a very young age at like 16. And for me to assume that I knew how to be sober and also live sober and conduct myself. I, no, I no. wasn't supposed to know. And that would have saved me a whole lot of anxiety. <laughs> right? Yeah. Oh my goodness. That's actually a really good one. Yeah, we, we uh show up thinking that we have to know everything on day one. Yeah. And why? Why would we assume that? Yeah, <laughs> it's not funny. Yeah. I'm, I'm pretty a perf- perfectionist or something. <laughs> I know. <laughs> Workaholic much? <laughs> Maybe. Hello. Uh, what do you do for fun these days? Oh, oh my gosh. Well, I'm I'm obsessed with just like pampering myself in ways that are for fun or for free. Yay. Like because I used to, you know, I used to think everything was, you know, a price tag or whatever. And yeah. now I'm just like I grab some girlfriends, we go do like an outdoor sound bath or we go to Big Bear or we go like take the dogs out to the dog park or I love concerts. They, you do pay for a concert, but mm. I love me some R&B and a concert and just being outside. And uh, I love going to different retreats. I'm like a nerd. Mm. I'm, I'm always going to some kind of retreat. I just, I I just, right? Like, I just like, you know, put me at like for a weekend, just not in my day to day. I think anything that's not in the day to day and just like an experience is fun to me. That's what it is. It's, it's the experiences, right? It's, you know, I I love that, you know, the pampering for fun and for free stuff, but um, it's, it's really about experiences now. Right. It, and there's like, have you ever heard of Joe Dispenza? Yes. Oh my God. Becoming girl, I wanna... supernatural. Yeah. <laughs> I want to go to his, he has a week long retreat. I've, I have some friends who've been and they all come back saying it was an amazing life changing experience. Oh, see, that's my jam. Like that's, I will 
nerd out and have so much fun. <laughs> we should go to the uh, one in Mexico. There's one in Cancun or something. I think next okay, year. Yeah, I'm Let's sold. go. I'm so. We'll get all our friends together and we'll go. <laughs> that's that's a dream. Like the, right? that to me dreams. Like you're like yeah. throwing a little new food, a little. <laughs> Yes. A little something, a meeting in a different language or a different place. Like, ah, yeah. <laughs> so fun. Here, here for it. Awesome. Well, thank you for playing along with our little lightning round. I always feel like yeah. I learn so much and it leads to such good conversation when people talk about their favorite recovery resources and stuff, things they've learned. Um, well, let's talk a little bit about your recovery story. So you mentioned that you started drinking at 16. Um, what, why do you think you started drinking? Uh, well, for me, and I didn't understand, you know, till I literally got sober what alcoholism was or identifying as an alcoholic. But I knew from a very young age, I was not, I just wasn't like at ease. Mm -hmm. Like I wasn't at like, oh, this is great. This is fun. Like, let's just be carefree. Like I wasn't, I was always consumed with like, I don't feel like I'm enough. I don't feel like I fit in. I don't feel comfortable. Like I just didn't. And I thought, you know, that's just how you feel. And I also had, um, you know, a very, oh, I have a dog. Sorry, he's doing too much. That's okay. Uh, <laughs> I um I had two parents that were very very loving and very kind, but they were um very um educational and education based and high performance and uh you know, to me that felt very critical and very pressured. And um, my father is uh, an Ethiopian immigrant from Ethiopia. And um, so growing up, I always had this notion of what I'm supposed to be like. And somehow I don't fit in that. Yeah. And I knew and it was weird because my parents didn't drink. So I didn't have any alcohol in my house. I never had it like at a, like a dinner. I'd never seen it. I, it wasn't like a staple to me. Like I just had no experience with it, but I knew that something was going to take me away from whatever this fauna feeling was. And I drank and I drank at a party that I was way too young to be at, but. Oh, that's not, that sounds like there's a story there. <laughs> well, I grew up in Hollywood. Okay. So there was, there was a lot of that, but also again, my norm was insane. So I just, you know, thought that's what everybody did. Was it like a and, high school party or was it like an industry kind of party? No, it was, it was a birthday party for an older sister of a friend of mine. Okay. And by at that time, um, I was in an all girls private school. <laughs> and so uh, my parents weren't there, the pressure wasn't there, the, you know, the, the, I don't know that I was just off to the races. And I didn't even know what it was, but I slammed it. And Did someone hand I, you a drink or were you like, hey, give me no, one of those? I, I immediately, they were making drinks with like what I'm assuming was whiskey. I can't even tell you because I don't remember. <laughs> but they're making drinks and they're older. They're maybe like 18, 20. I don't think anyone's legal, but they're making drinks. And I grabbed a Coke. I was drinking a Coke, Coca-Cola. And I just gave them my Coke can and I was like, put some of that in there. <laughs> and they were like, what? I'm like, just, just put some of that. Like, I have no idea how much or like what it does, anything. I was just put some in there. And I just remember taking a sip and that warm, fuzzy, <laughs> like, oh, just like everything is good. And you don't have to hear this, your brain. And I chugged it. And I remember asking for another and they were just like, what 
are you doing? And I kind of had, you know, I was just like, I don't care, just do it. And then that's the last I remembered. Wow. And apparently I was uh, carried out by her older brother and sister and I had vomited all over this girl's party. Ooh, awkward. Yeah. That sounds like my first drunk. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> oh, man, there is nothing worse than waking up the next morning and being like, oh, did you know, or your friends being like, do you know what you did last night? Nope. <laughs> do you nope. remember bits and pieces of the night? Nothing. Nope. You blacked out <laughs> right away. Blacked out right away. Brutal. And then you yeah. had to hear the stories. How did you feel the next morning when you heard the stories about what you did? Um, you know, that's when I realized I hate feelings. <laughs> Is that like you telling me something intimately dis- disgusting about myself? Um, I'm like, yeah, I'm not processing that. Like that's going one ear out the other and I'm going to drink again. I, I immediately was just like, oh, okay. Like, I'm still going to drink. That's amazing. Fine. Like, I was like, I'm not, I'm not going to. And that's when like, now looking back, like I major avoidance, like major, just inability to, to see the truth and to feel feelings. Mm -hmm. Um, I just couldn't do it. I mean, it sounds like you completely, like the next day, like you black out and then the next day you hear all this stuff. It's like so painful. I mean, that's what disassociation and disconnection is all about. Absolutely. Yeah, that's brutal. Um, And so how did it go after that? So was it like, I mean, you're probably not drinking every day at 16. (laughs) How did it progress for you? Um. Well, it, you're exactly right. It did not go like that. Um, that was my intro, but also um, I had the idea that I was just going to, you know, follow along and kind of the Hollywood, like grow up scene and just party with my friends and drink on, you know, whenever binge drink and then start getting ready to like graduate and go to college. And like, you know, it'd be this, like, I I always thought that they were milestones Mm -hmm. because I, I had such a different household that I wanted these American kind of milestones so badly. Like I wanted, I wanted the parties and the graduation and the off to college and you get drunk and, I mean, of course, see, I'm still saying those are my ideals of milestones. They're not (laughs) normal people's milestones. Yeah, they are. You know, rites of passage is what we have. That's what we have here. School and graduations and all that. But it didn't go, it didn't end up like that for me. Um, I mostly just drank um, knowing that it was an escape for me. And um, I really early on, knew it was a like a best friend Mm. I never I I never seemed to drink like my friends since the beginning um it was always a solution and um I didn't get to do the fun milestones and party things because when I was 16 around that same time unbeknownst to me um my father was diagnosed with leukemia. He didn't know? He knew, but he didn't I, tell me. He, how, and you were around 16 years old? Mm-hmm. Oh, my God. Actually, no. Wait, 16 was when it became visibly noticeable. And, like, he, he would start to talk about it to some people. But um, he had known for seven years and did not tell me and swore my entire family and friend group well, was my family is just me and my mom and dad um but extended people that they were not allowed to tell me that he was sick oh how do you feel so, about that now do you think he spared you a lot of pain and suffering or do you wish he would have told you i feel like either way it's 
exactly horrible. Um, At the time, once I figured it out, um, because I was really angry when I started noticing, um, like I, I talk about it in my book, but I was really angry when I started noticing um, changes in his behavior and and changes in his health. And it was this gaslighting of like, there's nothing wrong. There's nothing wrong. Oh, he denied it. Oh yeah. 100%. Oh Oh, yeah. And that's, you know, my father was a very big presence. He was a very kind, wonderful father and to him, I know in his mind, he's like, there's no way you are going to tell my little girl that I'm not going to be here. Like, you guys cannot tell her. Um, but I'm spinning in my mind and I am i can't get answers from him. And I can't tell anybody because nobody knows. And so that reinforced again, I'm going to go back to my best friend and I'm going to drink. And I would drink at night and I would drink to go to sleep. And um, then finally around uh, a 17 ish, um, he finally couldn't stop hiding it anymore. Um, He was, you know, rapidly losing weight and falling and, you know, all these kinds of things. And then, um, my mom and dad uh, told, you know, I, I I basically cornered them in a room and said, what's wrong? And, you know, my mom looked at me and said, I need you to go on the computer because she they weren't great at computers and look up cures for leukemia. And um, I was like, oh, it hit me like a ton of bricks. And uh yeah. And so then, you know, all plans are off. I'm not going away to school. I'm not doing any of those things. Um, and I ended up, uh, you know, kind of focusing all my energy in finding, helping my dad and hospicing my dad. Mm-hmm. And your, it was your father passed away when you were 19. Yeah. Wow. That's so for two years. Right, two three years, you were caring for your dying father. Did you uh, know that he was dying? Towards the end, um, they kept saying like all kinds of stuff, like, you know, we're gonna try this radical thing, or we're gonna set. You know, I was driving him to City of Hope in L, um, outside of LA mm-hmm. for these really intensive infusions and like sitting and like, you know, we were like trying whatever. And so I, it was like a denial fantasy. It was just this wild denial fantasy that turned out to be uh, exactly what my mom would do to me after that. But um, (laughs) what do you mean? (laughs) Well, I did, uh, I, I, I did end up hospicing my dad and he did not um, end up, you know, making it and he right. passed away and um, it became me and my mom. And uh, we, my mom went into severe denial, um, you know, that like he had gone and mm-hmm. what were we going to do? And it was just her and I, and for the next like five years, we became this enmeshed, toxic, codependent unit of, um, you know, just trying to be everything for my mom and also, you know, like work and try and like, cause now our household has gone from two incomes to one and um, just juggling a million things. And, what I would find out again from my mom is that she also had been sick. And I did not know that um, she had been a diabetic for years and had never treated it or never talked about it or never, not what. She needed insulin shots and stuff? 
Yeah. Oh, yeah. Like she needed full treatment. She needed. And she wasn't doing anything? No. Wow. So my mom ended up getting extremely ill. And then I ended up hospicing my mom in the same house, in the same room where my dad died. Oh, my God. It was like a reoccurring nightmare. It was on, on, it was the most um, gut-wrenching, just unbelievable. I mean, I was, I was, I couldn't believe it and I, I couldn't speak it. So I, I carried that with me for so long that I knew the only way I could get it out was to write the book. Right. Because I was like, I don't, I can't even, I don't have words for no. what's going on in my life. Right so you now. were 24 when your mother passed away? 24, 25? Uh, no, she, that was, she was about eight years later. About and year. then, and then, and then we tried that same kind of triage for two years. And so I tried to get her to specialists and tried to do all these radical treatments. And again, I went into this denial that, you know, I can save her. And it, it just got progressively worse. And um, my mom finally passed away when I'm still in this idea that, you know, we're going to beat it. We're going to beat it. And she went into um, complete organ failure. And once that final piece was removed for me, like there's no more saving anyone. There's no more caretaking. There's no more hope. There's no more anything. Me and alcohol made a bet. And we were like, it's off to the races. I mean, I committed that day when she passed away that it was going to just be me and alcohol. And that was that that was the beginning of my my bottom. I mean, my pit. <laughs> yeah, that's a yeah. And so um, I'm so sorry about the loss of your parents. That's terrible. I, I recently lost my mom and I know what that feels like. And yes. yeah, my dad was my, I lost my dad three years ago, but he was, you know, he was older and yeah, it was, yeah. it was a very different situation. So it's still so hard. Yeah. So hard. And you were so young when all that happened. So, um, and it doesn't sound like you had any family to support you through that. Is that true? No, I mean, I, I'm not discrediting, you know, that my mom and dad had so many wonderful family friends, mm -hmm. uh, but nuclear family was me, my mom and dad. Okay. And the, 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 the thread that they committed me to was that we don't tell anybody this business. So nobody knew that what was going on in this house, our house. Mm -hmm. Yeah, that is so common. This idea of we, we don't like people holding their secrets close. That idea that you're only sick as your secrets. You know, that's like we don't we don't tell people what's you know about our pain. We don't ask for help. I don't, you know, I don't Absolutely. know what that is. Yeah, it, it just leads to such a dark place. It's one of the most counterintuitive, but also just damaging. Uh, ways to exist is this idea that, you know, you're alone, alone and you also have to hide, you know, this pain and the pain, what I learned manifests, you know, it's not hiding as much as we want to believe that it's hiding. It is not hiding. Mm -mm. It comes out and it comes out violently it comes out depression it comes out suicide it comes out maladaptive skills it comes out however it needs to so i the idea that you know i could even keep these secrets was a lie i told myself but i was physically i was so sick um just from holding this trauma alone you know there it is holding the trauma alone yeah, it will make us sick. Yeah, absolutely. Yeah. So you go through this period of time where you're basically just um, unregulated drinking, right? Yeah. And how long does that period of time last for? 
Like what happened? What happened during that time? I didn't last long. (laughs) I didn't um, because I I went on a mission and uh, it was just about, I think I'm going to say maybe under a year or a year. And um, I just locked myself up in my family house Mm -hmm. um, and I didn't touch anything. I still had my mom's easel from the funeral with the dead flowers and I had all of their things and I locked myself in there and I drank a handle of vodka um like just maybe I'd have like I could go through one in like two three days wow and that's it there's a lot of booze and this is delivery. So I didn't have to see anybody. Oh, wow. I didn't have to talk to anybody. And um, I really was on a mission to just die. Yeah. Drown the yeah. pain. I totally get that. What happened that you ended up in recovery? Was there like a, did you hit a bottom? Was, was there like a singular event or is, was it a series of events? It was singular. Mm-hmm. Um, I was so far removed um, that I had stopped eating and um, I had stopped communicating with the world. So I started having seizures um, by myself. And um, thankfully, uh, somebody, you know, caught on that I'm just like alone crashing around. And um, couple calls from my neighbors to friends that they knew because I, I grew up um, in the same area, in the same house with the same friends. So it was easy to like, be like, where's, what's Fauna doing? And they're like, we don't know. We, you know, she's, she's not answering our calls. And then they uh, finally, the, the seizures um, were, you know, getting so bad that the ambulance would show up. And um, the and, and they would call my friend, and um, my good friend, one of my best friends, um, he he said, "This is this is not this is not going to happen." And he was at work, and I I mean I know it now. I had could no recollection at the time. And he Second-hand said, "Secondhand stories." Yeah, they're telling me about my intervention. Wow. And, yeah. And so he said, oh, we're going to go to breakfast. I'm going to take you to breakfast. You need to eat. And um, I tried a million times to get out of it. And he said, no, nope, sit down. You're going to go to breakfast. You need to eat something. And immediately I'm like, where can I have a mimosa? Can I have a drink? And I said, no, there's no alcohol here. And I said, wait a minute. <laughs> what? And um, he said, Fana, you know, we none of us have lost a parent or anyone who's died yet um and two and your all family is gone we don't know how to help you Mm. and we don't know what to say and we don't know what to do and we want to get you help and I remember the combination and this was paramount for me with grief was one somebody validating that they did not know this experience and that I was in uncharted territory by myself. And two, that I was in excruciating pain. And three, that there was some miracle place or something that could help me, you know, because I didn't grow up with support groups or, you know, therapy and all these modalities and like reaching out and assistance. I, you know, I I had no idea that uh, things like that existed. So I thought if I don't make it, that's just, I don't make it. And I just remember I sighed this relief and I just looked at my friend and I said, they're going to help me. Hmm. And he said, I, let's try. And I packed a bag and was on a plane. They had pulled together money for me. And I woke up in Utah. <laughs> you woke up in Utah. <laughs> you, you went to tr- treatment in Utah. I went to treatment in Utah. Had never heard of treatment. 
I didn't know it existed. I didn't know AA existed. I didn't know people were alcoholics. I, I was so like green. I just was like. You just hadn't been exposed to any of that. No, I knew the dark side of it. Like I knew, you know, over, yeah. over, over and partying in the hall. Like I knew that. Yeah. I didn't know the support side of it. Right, you're right. <laughs> I didn't know. You know, the recovery side. Yeah. Yeah. That's amazing. Okay, so you did like a 30-day in, inpatient treatment center type thing? Well, that again, I no, I didn't. <laughs> I'm a weirdo. Uh, no, I got there, um, and I was so bad um, that I had to be detoxed for oh. at 10 days, um, which was beyond their limit. And um, I had, uh, I was in alcoholic psychosis and um, I had wet brain stage two and um, I couldn't talk. I couldn't walk. I, I was, my muscles had atrophied. Wow. Uh, so they were getting ready to just charge me to the psychiatric mental hospital. And um, I don't know what happened. It's in the book. It's the craziest. <laughs> and I don't even know myself to this day what happened. <laughs> but uh, I was hallucinating. I was talking to people that weren't there. I was having a full and I just snapped out of it. And you just got clarity and just came to Yep. I just was talking to someone and I, in my brain, they were someone else and I was somewhere else. And I just like this just came to, and they were like, Fauna. And I was like, yes. They're like, can you see me? And I'm like, yeah. And they're like, oh my God. (laughs) That is crazy. You just kind of snap back into your body yes that's wild and then they so, sent you and then they sent you to treatment yeah so okay. so of course I had to stay much longer okay yeah yeah so I I did uh 90 no yeah 90 days and then I did the entire step down process so okay. I did 90 days then I went to extended care for 90 days then I went to sober living and then I went to an apartment sober apartment wow that is quite a journey um so Um, here we are (laughs) yeah (laughs) here we are looking back at this crazy experience that you had and so you got sober um in 2019 that's like right right in the middle of the pandemic huh it was right yeah right before um i think yeah i think yeah like right before yeah 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 i had like one year of i think it was like we started in like 2020 okay and so i um, I had gotten out on my own, but I still was, you know, very shaky. And I now I had to navigate Los Angeles recovery. And um, I hear Los Angeles recovery is really good. It's the most. I mean, I'm biased, okay. but <laughs> to me, it was. I mean, I'm an LA native, yeah, and to see my city from a whole new lens like I was like you guys come here in the day like (laughs) there's like this place exists like I thought this was a parking lot like it's it was just wild I felt like a kid like exploring the city and I was it was so communicative like it was just very community-based yeah um but I did learn very early on from my recovery that because I was so far off and so uh, traumatized mm-hmm. that um, safety was paramount for me. So I was women's only. 
um, for meetings, recovery, um, my therapists, my clinicians, um, my sponsor, my friend community group, uh, were women. All women. Yeah. I, I find that to be, um, really important. There's a lot of, um, you know, it's, you know, the court system is sending people to 12 step meetings that really truly don't belong there. Right. And so the women, there's a lot of predatory behavior. So women really need to be careful. Right. I, I remember even year I got sober in 94, even then the lady, the women would pull me aside and be, yeah, they would pull me aside and be like, uh, you need to go to women's meetings. You're 25 oh. years old. You need to go I to women's agree. meetings. I, I mean, you know, everybody uh, responds to, to different ways, you know, like everybody's live and let live kind of thing. Um, yeah. But I, I think especially when you're in younger sobriety, I mean, people mm-hmm. are getting sober younger and yeah, younger. That's younger. great. Yeah amazing and then they're also realizing that you know the younger um people that are coming in have had way more experience than um you know before when they thought marijuana was a gateway drug and like these kinds of soft ideas i mean you know they're coming in with maybe you know been on the streets and heroin hardcore for usage years yeah. and fentanyl and Ugh. you know um when your brain and you're still developing and, and your, you know, your growth might've stopped at 12 yeah. and you're going back into, you know, this community by yourself um, as a young person still navigating, like what's real, what's not, what's safe, what's this. Um, I think young people's meetings are amazing. Yeah. If you can, get I to think, them. yeah, LA has tons um, and women's uh, men's men's meetings and women's meetings, um, and also LGBTQ and queer meetings are super important. It's like representation matters. I was going to ask you about that. You know, um, in some of the um, information I got from your from your people, they talked about you know um, a lack of resources or representation for women of color. Can you speak to that? To Like, well, how did that affect you? Cause you grew up in a very eclectic neighborhood, um, with all kinds of different people. Uh, what did you see missing in the recovery community? Oh, absolutely. I mean, I, I clearly was, you know, skewed cause I was, around so much diversity from a very young age um, that when I did come into recovery and I would continuously, continuously be the one woman of color in the room, in the building, in the, in the facility, in the state, in, you know, like um, it's, it's, it's absolutely what some people call an outside issue. But when you, when you are in the rooms and there are, you know, systematic things outside that can contribute to your sobriety. And, um, you know, you don't see that in the meeting or in the community of somebody that you can share that with, hold that pain with. Remember, we talked about sharing the pain and not mm-hmm. the secret. Um, if there's not that some person that you can, can give that to that can honor it and see it, um, it gets, it creates a lot of barriers and it's very difficult. Um, so there's a lot of young people's meetings and there's a lot of women that are, you know, women of color, indigenous that are, um, from certain areas that don't get maybe the, the fancier meeting rooms or that mm. the softer modalities of bringing sound baths in or bringing, you know, and, Girl, I don't and even know what that is. You said sound bath earlier and I'm like, I'm from Silicon Valley. I do. I still don't know what that is. <laughs> <laughs> it's amazing. Is it? What is it? What's a sound bath? It's it's uh, musical frequencies that raise or balance your vibrations. Your oh, harmonic. Is that with the uh, I, I those uh, YouTube videos that are like oh eighty four megahertz to restore. Yeah. Oh, is that what that is? Yep. I do that all the time. <laughs> I didn't know that that's. I didn't know what that was. Okay. 
All yes. Right. But there's brilliant women that are, um, that have amazing recovery, yeah. that are, you know, women of color, women um, that are in recovery, work in recovery, where they might be the only Black or um, Latina or Asian uh, clinician or recovery advocate in their entire agency. That's amazing. And amazing. It's, it's really surprising to me. It's not. It's not surprising? <laughs> No, I just think, you know, we, we got that's it's, it's, we got to collaborate and, and pool resources and bring, you know, what so many people experience is top shelf recovery, like the very um, elite, the very expensive, the very um, all encompassing and, um, you know, bring some of that and bring uh, cultural um, identities into it. You know, there are one of the biggest components of staying sober is being able to see longevity with it. And that means connecting right. it to your culture. Right. Yeah. You know, if you get sober in a bubble and it's all predominantly white and you're Native American or you're African American or African and you go home and there's there's no wellness there's no community uh, meetings. There's no sponsor there for you. There, you know, how do you stay sober? And you can clearly, because we do. But also, there are so many people that are bridging that divide. There you go. And um, you know, creating resources, cre- bringing stuff into communities that normally don't have, you know, some of the more uh, pampered ideas, mm-hmm. and. Um, and, and crossing those resources. And um, I'm working with amazing women that um, are head of boards, are head clinicians, are you know, recovery advocates, and just being there to like speak on panels, to speak on um, you know, uh, meetings that they're talking about. What does the prison experience look like when you're trying to get sober? And what and 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 the parallels of systematic racism within that, and you know how you're treated if you're a young white person with a drug addiction, or you're a young brown person with the drug addiction, and it's just you know it's an entire world, and I happen to be very passionate about it, and um, I just I think that there's so many people to be helped, and to think that it's like monolithic and like one way is doing a disservice. And so I just want to be a part of inclusion and like creating more avenues and more representation. It's so important. Your visibility is so important. It's so important to so many. And um, I know you have a website where people can get a hold of you, the good, the good work, (laughs) W-R-K. The good work, work. Yes. Yeah. I mean, for those, you are a resource, you know, there's, I know that you, well, maybe I shouldn't speak for you. Do you want to tell me a little bit about what kind of services you offer and how, if there are people of color or anybody really who wants to get a hold of you to do some of this work, you know, how do you, how do you help people? I mean, you have the book, which is amazing. I think that's super important and you're doing your public service, you know, work as well, but how do you work with people one-on-one? Oh, absolutely. Um, Well, I do recovery coaching and that's specifically in line with, you know, alcohol and drug counseling Mm -hmm. and um, taking people that might not fit into the typical mold of like a treatment center or um, they have been through, you know, a 30 day program or something that but they want you know, stability and they want to build skills and they want to build tools and they want to engage in the community and they want resources and they want to get plugged in. And um, my point of like the good work is that it's, it's ongoing, it's Mm -hmm. continuous, right? So it's like always looking at like, what are barriers for our sober, big, beautiful life? And what are we willing to look at? And what are we willing to let go of and dismantle while bringing in skills-based, strength-based, core-based, like smart goals and actual tangible results so that you're seeing, you know, some market progress. 
that is not a sponsor because we all need sponsors right. and that is that is to you know unload and to mentally and spiritually and hopefully communitively be a part of um but it's the skills it's what comes when you do sometimes get to go to those fancier places and um it's life skills and tools and um navigating and achieving goals and also kind of living your highest life in sobriety. Yeah, absolutely. That's, that's amazing. I love you too. And I know you have, um, you're updating your website with workshops and things like that. So, um, I just, I'll leave a link to your website in the show notes so that those who, um, are resonating with you can reach out to you and work with you. I mean, there's, there's, there is so much need out there and I just applaud you for all the work that you've done and you're so young. You have such a bright career ahead of you and I just see you helping so many people. So I uh, thank you so much for joining me today and, and sharing thank your story. You. Thank you so much. I loved being a part of this and this is just, you are also doing amazing sacred work. So. <laughs> thank you so much. Thank you for having me. I look forward to talking with you soon. Yes, can't wait. All right, thank you so much. Thanks. One last thing before you go, you can follow the podcast on Instagram for daily inspiration at ODAT Podcast. And if you'd like to get a bi-weekly email from me with recommendations to books I'm reading, meditations I love, or other recovery podcasts, just sign up for it at odatchat.com. That's O-D-A-A-T chat.com. And if you do, I hope you enjoy it.